Digital Foundry is proudly sponsored by Omen's new wireless range of mice, keyboards and headsets. The new Titan is here. The RTX 3090 may not come with the traditional name, which is an interesting topic of debate in its own right, but the $1,500 price tag and 24 gigs of GDDR6X memory show that this is firmly a prosumer GPU designed for the likes of scientists and content creators who will consider the card a cheaper alternative to Nvidia's professional Quadro line. 3090 is also pitched as a gaming monster though, capable of driving an 8K display at a time when even 4K has yet to be broadly adopted, certainly for PC gamers. So there is an extra dimension here, the idea of a GPU that's appealing to the ultra high-end gamer. Again, fertile Titan territory. All told, a fascinating candidate for review then, as there's so much to cover. There's its unique triple slot cooler, the fully enabled GA102 GPU inside, based on the new Ampere architecture, all combined into what Nvidia promises to be the world's fastest graphics card. We'll put that claim to the test in our newly redesigned gauntlet of gaming benchmarks and yes, we've got our own impressions of the card's hardware design. Of course, the new Ampere lineup represents an important moment for the green team. After going through the pain of introducing new features like uh, hardware accelerated ray tracing and DLSS in the last generation, atop what was a modest performance increase compared to price equivalent predecessors, the 30 series cards are a chance to back up those innovations with a kind of raw speed that turns a fledgling technology into a must-buy purchase. Nvidia has relied on a die shrink to accomplish this, moving from TSMC's 12 nanometer process for Turing to Samsung's 8 nanometer process for Ampere. Now, if you compare the RTX 3090 and the RTX 2080 Ti, the new card has 50% more transistors, yet its die is 20% smaller which unlocks both efficiency and performance improvements. Combine this with architectural changes like next-gen ray tracing and even more efficient tensor cores, along with faster, more efficient memory, and obviously you've got a recipe for a seriously capable graphics card. In the case of the RTX 3080, the combination resulted in a massive increase in horsepower. But what do you get for your extra $700 with the RTX 3090? Part of that extra cash has no doubt gone into the thermal solution. Now, I was impressed with the RTX 3080 founder's novel flow-through cooler, which has uh, one fan on each side of the card. But the 3090, well, that takes it to another level. Both the genuine triple slot design, and it's certainly a hefty piece of kit. Weighs over two kilos, this thing. Uh, this graphics card is longer than the Xbox Series X is tall and you may struggle to fit it into a standard case, so if you're planning to get one, uh, check your allowances carefully. The card's pennant-shaped PCB leaves the entire back end of the card free for a hefty aluminium thin block, and combined with the card's inflated volume, its sheer size, you get substantial cooling performance. Now, I don't have the equipment for vigorous thermal testing, but I noted that the card spends most of its time in the mid-60s to 70 degrees Celsius, meaning that it's up there with some of the best of the third-party cooling solutions. Only this time, we're dealing with a GPU with a 350-watt TDP. And yes, that does mean that once again we're getting the new 12-pin power interface, though curiously only two 8-pin power inputs are required via the bundled adapter, even though I've seen third-party 3080s that require three of them. Thankfully, makers of modular power supplies are selling or giving away dedicated full-length cables, terminating in the new 12-pin connector, if you do prefer a tidier look. So, RTX 3090, it dwarfs the old Dewing cards like the Titan RTX here, and comes across as a jumbo size 3080. And like its counterpart, the new card has a full complement of high bandwidth ports, including one HDMI 2.1, and three DisplayPort 1.4a connections on this Founders Edition card we're testing. Uh, the HDMI 2.1 port is critical for high-resolution, high-refresh gaming on TVs and next-gen monitors, 
as its 48 gigabits per second of bandwidth allows for 10 or indeed 12 bit color at 4K resolution and a refresh rate of 120 Hertz. It'll also allow for an 8K connection at 60 Hertz, something that Nvidia has already leaned into heavily in its marketing of the 3090, despite a vanishingly small number of 8K displays on the market. But it's time to talk numbers, ultimately. Look, this is a Titan-like product, so you know the score going in. The script almost writes itself. We're talking about an iterative increase in performance up against the 3080, which was the card that Nvidia chose to introduce us to the Ampere lineup. You'll get the improved cooling performance and acoustics, which really are great, but it's also about the extra RAM, 24 gigs of G6X versus 10 gigs, uh, this time over a 384-bit memory interface. Historically, you don't see the benefit of this extra memory in current generation games, but it certainly helps to future-proof the card. However, for non-gaming use cases, like my video editing for this channel, it really makes a difference. But first of all, let's dive right on in to the game benchmarks. We'll start off by revisiting what I called the super performers in the 3080 review. The games that deliver significantly higher performance uplifts versus the old Turing and especially the Pascal architectures. Digging into Borderlands 3, uh, our comparison points here are the 3080, 2080 Ti, Titan RTX. First thing to note is that you may notice that the two Turing cards are often very, very close in performance terms in all of the benchmarks you're about to see. I was quite surprised by this. I mean, I use Titan RTX more for content creation than 2080 Ti for reasons that you'll discover later on in this review. But regardless, I think the small gap here is basically because Nvidia actually added a factory overclock to the 2080 Ti founders that we're benching here. So what I'd expect to be a 10% uplift in performance is often significantly lower when we check out our metrics here. Anyway, good results with the 3090 in Borderlands 3 where it delivers a 16% boost over the 3080, rising to an impressive 53% over Titan RTX. Percentage differentials are kind of fascinating in how the numbers compare versus actual perception. 2080 Ti and Titan RTX are indeed very similar, but the 3090's boost here over the Ti increases to 59%. Another interesting data point is that you're getting a 2.33 times multiplier in performance over 1080 Ti. So Titan XP will be in that ballpark as well. As you would expect, Doom Eternal shows up some big results too. 3090 is over 15% faster than 3080 and wipes the floor with the old Turing cards with a 47% increase over Titan RTX. And yeah, that rises to 55% when stacked up against RTX 2080 Ti. Pretty gigantic stuff then, and for those of you looking for a Pascal data point, I clocked a 2.7 times multiplier over GTX 1080 Ti. Doom Eternal does have some memory limitation issues at 4K at these settings with 8GB cards, but everything in our lineup here has 10, 11, or 24 gigs of RAM. In the here and now at least, that's great for 4K gaming. Remedies control next with a benchmark that takes in the first areas of play. Not so dynamic perhaps, but easily repeatable in a game that is otherwise very variable from one run to the next, has few cutscenes and no specific benchmark option. This game runs pretty poorly on Pascal, meaning that 3090 versus 1080 Ti sees a 2.8 times multiplier in performance. This would only change very slightly up against Titan XP on the same architecture. Just over 13% of extra performance up against 3080, but still a useful 46% boost over Titan RTX, rising to 51 up against 2080 Ti. Interestingly, there is one super performer that only sees a more modest uptick versus 3080, and that's Shadow of the Tomb Raider. It's a more interesting benchmark in that it encompasses three gameplay areas to more accurately represent variations in workload across the entire game. Anyway, the boost going from 3090 from 3080, just under 10%, which is kind of more in line with the traditional TI versus Titan differential on previous architectures. Still looking at a 39% increase in performance versus the Titan RTX, rising to 44% up against 2080 TI founders. And yes, the Pascal differential numbers are still big. It's still a 2.3 times multiplier in frame rate up against 1080 TI. 
So look, I'd urge you to take a look at the Eurogamer article linked in the video description below, where like some kind of insane maniac, I've benchmarked a lot more games and done so at 1080p and 1440p resolutions too. Truth is though, in many games at those resolutions, we can find ourselves CPU limited even with a Core i9-10900K with all cores locked to 5 GHz. So high resolution ultra wide displays, 4K, 5K, perhaps even 8K, that's where you're really going to be looking to eke out every scintilla of power the 3080 and the 3090 deliver. I mean, for example, check out the Hitman 2 benchmark here. 1080p and 1440p versus RTX 2080 Ti. Kind of extreme perhaps, but this is the biggest red flag with ear-splitting klaxons attached I can use to show you uh, what happens when you have this much GPU power on a resolution constrained scenario. Even the best gaming CPU on the planet won't be able to deliver that much difference. Bottom line, in these scenarios, your super expensive GPU is being underutilized and your money is better spent elsewhere. But moving on to benchmarks where the differences are palpable, Death Stranding, still a very strong delivery on RTX 3080 versus 2080, but it fell a little bit short compared to the super performers and not surprisingly, you see much the same thing going on with RTX 3090, where the performance up against its Ampere stablemate Closer to 10%, not the 15 that we'd ideally want to see based on the specifications. With that in mind, there's a mere 30% improvement over Titan RTX and 37% improvement up against 2080 Ti founders. Uh, but once again, you know, let's put this into perspective. Um, the 3090, yes, it's more expensive than the 2080 Ti, but it is price comparable and it is obviously a lot cheaper than the Titan RTX. Now I'd love to tell you what the Pascal equivalent is, but the benchmark here still crashes with access violation errors on pretty much any Pascal card I test. Assassin's Creed Odyssey next, a benchmark I'm starting to almost despise owing to its almost entirely random lowest 1% scores and the way that the cloud formations are randomized between each run, meaning that you can see wildly different results and by extension, very different percentage differentials between the cards. I'm fairly certain that we're looking at another game with a 9% improvement going from 3080 to 3090 and this rises to 37% up against Titan RTX. But yeah, getting that result, wow, what a pain. Anyway, it's still a good showing versus Pascal, a 1.8 times multiplier to performance. Now look, I could continue to roll out the results here, uh, but really all of the benchmarks you need are all laid out for you in the Eurogamer article linked in the video description below. And well, spoilers, you'll continue to see the same differentials. RTX 3090 is essentially 9 to 16 percent faster than 3080 depending on the game you test and depending on the scenarios you test within those games. On to ray tracing now where, once again, I'm going to save you from too much data. Alex Battaglia is still working on his deep dive for Ampere and you'll see some fascinating analysis there uh, that goes beyond the mere numbers. But really what we're seeing in terms of the raw benchmarks is a continuation of what we saw with RTX 3080, which is to say that the harder you push ray tracing in any given game, the bigger the gains you'll get versus the 20 series Turing cards. You can see that at its best with Quake 2 RTX using a demo workout designed by Alex. This is pure path tracing action, total ray tracing, very little, if any, traditional rasterization. 1440p resolution here and indeed in all of our RT benchmarks. And well, check it out. 14.6% faster than 3080 overall with a big 58% speed increase versus Titan RTX, rising to 69% versus 2080 Ti. Moving into the hybrid RT benchmarks, our control workout essentially pushes the load more onto ray tracing ahead of rasterization by utilizing a return visit to Alex Battaglia's Corridor of Doom. Another 14% boost up against 3080, rising to 54% up against Titan RTX. So 63 point gain against 2080 Ti. Obviously no point really with Pascal comparisons here because there's no ray tracing acceleration on those cards. So yeah, I do think with that in mind, Ampere GPUs can be seen as a good jumping on point for getting ray tracing support 
particularly as the implementation in the upcoming Cyberpunk 2077 looks pretty amazing. It may well be a turning point for many people in how they plan their next GPU upgrade. But it's worth pointing out the notion of hybrid rendering and what this means for the performance numbers. The big boost to RT power kind of requires ray tracing to be pushed to the forefront. So in the Battlefield 5 ray tracing benchmark, RTX 2080 Ti and Titan RTX are essentially identical in performance terms, while the 3090 is just a tick over 9% faster than 3080. Nvidia's new BF GPU flagship is about 38% faster than Titan RTX here. I'll finish up with the Metro Exodus bench, ultra across the board, an extraordinary load here in an extraordinary benchmark that really pushes GPUs excessively hard. RTX 3090 can still deliver an 86 frames per second average in this benchmark, which is, well, pretty impressive. Over 14% higher than 3080 with a 43 point uptick over Titan RTX. Now, there's more to the 3090 than this, of course. It's being sold directly as an 8K gaming unit. So, rather difficult to process this because I genuinely think to assess 8K gaming, you need an 8K screen and I hope to address that soon. But you can use Nvidia's DSR downscaling to simulate performance, although this does incur something like a 3 to 5% performance deficit. So consider this an early look at what might be possible with this card on an 8K screen, uh, because I am using a 4K capture card and DSR to get these numbers. So 8K gaming, what's the bottom line? Um, I think you're going to need to pick and choose your battles. You're gonna to have to be careful with settings, but yeah, check this out. Dirt Rally 2.0, this is the benchmark sequence running at 8K on high settings. It's pretty much there at 8K 60, but you are getting some small drops to performance. Uh, one thing we really need to stress before we go on, 8K, it's four times the resolution of 4K. You know, like 33 million pixels versus around 8 million pixels at 4K. This is an insane workload. Regardless, 8K60, you are getting there. Just some small drops to performance. And I do wonder how this one would play out on an actual 8K screen without the DSR overhead. Next up, Doom Eternal. So I'm running this at 8K Ultra, and it's a bit of a mixed bag from the 40s right up to 60 frames per second. But this is where dynamic resolution scaling helps. You get full 8K resolution when the GPU can afford it. And when it can't, the game can lean into temporal super sampling to make up the difference, even though the native rendering resolution can be uh, lower moment to moment. And when you do have DSR enabled, you're at 54 to 60 frames per second. Then again, I do wonder how that would pan out on an actual 8K screen without DSR hitting performance. So Nvidia's not so secret weapon, AI upscaling via DLSS. Again, we really need to take a look at how this scales to 8K in quality terms, but the performance win is palpable. Death Stranding works fine on Ampere cards at 4K60, uh, so with DLSS performance mode, we can get to 8K60. However, um, in many different games, weird stuff tends to happen at extreme resolutions. And we don't know how realistic DSR is compared to running on an actual 8K screen, but what I did see is a kind of rhythmic frame rate drop that occurs frequently. You can see it here. So finally, control, 8K60 via DLSS, no problem, but ray tracing does seem to cause some instability. Again, I wanna see how this all plays out when everything is properly configured on an actual 8K screen. But then again, to what extent do you need the 3090 for that? After all, the 3080 isn't that much slower. All of which brings us to the RTX 3090's advantage that is less quantifiable. It's 24 gigs of memory. Well, if we look back over time, pretty much the only Kepler-class cards that still uh, keep up with modern games are the 6 gigabyte Titan and Titan Black. But that advantage, it's outweighed really by the fact that by the time that memory does become relevant, you've likely moved on to another GPU, particularly if you can afford Titan class cards in the first place. So what is the value of 24 gigs? All I can offer is my personal opinion. At Digital Foundry, we use 11 and 12 gig GPUs for 4K editing as a baseline, as the absolute minimum. That level of memory is required to ensure 
that uh, when we make a video with heavy processing work, we can actually export it at the end without errors. I've been using Titan RTX precisely because of this. I can push harder on the timeline, knowing I won't be wasting time when the edit's done on exports that crash. So in that sense, the idea of the RTX 3090, or indeed Titan RTX, as a Quadro-style card uh, that has cutbacks on drivers and support I probably don't even need, well, for me as a creator, makes perfect sense. But it's not going to make sense for the mainstream, clearly, and this isn't a mainstream product, just like the Titans before it. So RTX 3090 really is more of an aspirational Halo product in many ways, but it does have a more affordable alternative available. I guess my final point is this, I'm curious about the whole 3090 naming convention and why this simply isn't called a Titan. Equally, by extension, the TI brand also has extreme clout, so retiring either of those brands makes no sense to me. So what does this mean for the future? Does this mean that there's an even bigger chip in development? A chip that will manifest as a new Titan? Well, I'm going to be interested to see how all of that pans out. But that's pretty much everything I have to say about all of this right now. So I'll sign off with the usual call to action, which is to say, please do like and subscribe. This is all good stuff. As is ringing the bell, which gives you instant notifications when new Digital Foundry content is published on our channel. The DF Patreon is there for those that love what we do, who want to support the team more directly. And of course, you'll get pristine quality video downloads there for everything we do. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this one, if indeed you did. And of course, thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry. Featuring its new warp wireless technology, Omen's PC peripherals allow for lag-free gaming. From the 360-degree audio of its Omen frequency headphones, the 180-hour battery life of the Vector Mouse, and the 2.4 GHz connection of its Spacer keyboard, Omen has you covered for the ultimate wireless experience.